So it's five minutes past the hour, and I think we can probably get started. Um, so just going over what we're uh, here for, what we're going to be doing today. Um, if you haven't already, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're dialing in from. We're going to have about 40 minutes of presentations uh, from uh, several Roar users and Roar adopters. And then we should have about 15 minutes left at the end for audience Q&A. But as I did mention earlier, if you'd like to use the chat to ask questions, um, do feel free to do that. Obviously, um, you know, hopefully pay attention to all the presentations as well as asking questions of the, the person who has just presented. Um, but we do hope to have an active chat and also an active question and answer um, period at the end. Uh, we will be sharing the recording as well as the slides after the meeting. Um, so if you do happen to miss something, uh, these will be available. They'll be sent to you and they'll be publicly available. You may have noticed that we are already recording. And so we'll uh, be sure to let you access that after the meeting. Uh, these are our presenters today. Um, we're first going to hear from Kyle Demis, who is the Vice President of Research Intelligence at Our Research, which produces Open Alex. He's going to talk to us about Roar and Open Alex. We'll hear from Andre Bellini, who is Chief Technology Innovation Officer at Force Science, who will talk to us about Roar in DSpace Chris, which I'm very excited to hear about. We'll hear from Paloma Marina Raisa, Engagement Manager at ORCID, about Roar in ORCID. She has some wonderful charts for you. Daria Piccinelli, Process and Content Management Project Coordinator at Springer Nature, will talk to us about um, some work that we've been doing, I think, over the last year or so uh, with Roar um, to use Roar in their publishing workflows at Springer Nature. Very exciting. Savannah Sims, who uh, works with the U.S. Department of Energy, the Office of Science and Technical Information, OSTI, uh, will talk to us about um, some work they've done with Roar, um, really focusing more on curation, um, getting the um, hierarchical structure of DOE correct in ROAR, uh, as well as some other initiatives that OSTI is undertaking. And then finally, we'll hear um, a co-presentation from Eric Olson, who's product manager at the Center for Open Science uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, and Luca Balletti, who is uh, senior product manager at Elsevier uh, for Mendeley Data, and they are co-chairs of the NIH Gray ROAR Implementation Task Group. Some of you may be familiar with this initiative. It's the Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative in which NIH is attempting to have several generalist repositories work together to set best practices and standards for data sharing for researchers. And that's, those are our panelists. And we're going to begin um, with Kyle Demis. So Kyle, um, you should have a uh, co-host permissions, so feel free to share your screen and begin presenting. All right, great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to bring it up right now. Can someone just confirm that they do see my slides? Yes, and indeed. Can hear me okay? All right. I'll, yep. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you, Amanda, for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here today. I learned about Roar for the first time when I started using Open Alex, and it's been a game changer. It is the only sticker I've put on my laptop, and I bring it to every meeting and evangelize Roar, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I don't have much time, but I do want to give you a quick sense of how we're using Roar to enable research intelligence at Open Alex. If you haven't heard that term research intelligence before, the idea here is that research activities are happening all around the world. And if we collect data on those activities, we can analyze it in a way that gives us insights that we can make better decisions. And that can be very broad. Um, to give you a sense of the common things people are asking, how does my institution contribute to the sustainable development goals? And how does that compare to another institution that we're thinking about? Or on the top right, how is our progress towards open access happening at our institution? We're committed to it. And this is a graph from the University of British Columbia. And you can see over the last couple of years, they finally reached that tipping point. And then at the bottom right, who are we collaborating with on particular topics? And all three of these are um, data sets from Open Alex that were enabled by Roar. And I'll get to that in a second. The problem that most people have is that institutions actually don't get any data on their research outputs. I think they're probably the only organization in the world that doesn't have an inventory of what they're doing. Um, another story, but the idea here is that researchers are publishing in journals outside of their institutions. And that's really important for the, the quality of peer review, but they're not getting that feedback loop of what they're doing. That's where Open Alex comes in. We are an open index of the world's research ecosystem, and we have 250 million works, just shy of that, actually. Um, and we collect metadata about those works and, and allow people to aggregate uh, 
based on their needs. And I've underlined here institutions because this is where Roar fits in. For each publication, we're going through and we're getting the authors and we get what, what are called affiliation strings. And this is what they can look like. These are actually three of the cleaner ones that are easy to match, uh, but these can come in all shapes and sizes. And basically we've developed a machine learning algorithm that goes through and tries to match those affiliation strings that we extract with existing Roar IDs. And it's these Roar IDs that are really important because they have curated metadata about the institutions. And I will say anytime institutions find something that isn't right, I can point them to Roar and they've been really responsive. And this feedback loop has been really critical for us. But because we're able to sort of match all of these publications to the institution, we can then link any of the other metadata and run analyses for those institutions. And to give you a sense quickly, this is a, an example of our user interface that was just launched a few months ago. Um, I put a QR code here because everything we do is open and free. You don't need a license for Open Alex. You can just go right now and replicate this exact analysis. But the idea here is that you can type in an institution and then pull whatever sort of report you want on it. So anyone who's attending is welcome to do this. But I also, in the last minute, am just going to quickly show you what that's like live. Can someone confirm that they see my browser? Yes? OK, great. So anyone can go to openalex.org right now. There's no license required. It pops up with a magic box. And you can search terms here, like Kelp Ecology. That's, that's my field. Or you can just start typing the name of an institution. So here I type in Simon Fraser University. And we're getting the metadata about this from Roar. And when I click that, it's going to bring up all of the works in Open Alex that we've attributed to Simon Fraser University. So feel free to do this and play along with your institution. But also notice on the right here, we have a reporting section. We've got four fields that we think people look at a lot. So feel free to look at those. But you can also click more and add many other different things. So you can look at the open access color, for instance. You can look at the institution country of who an institution is collaborating with. You can look at what types of institutions they're collaborating with, whether they're from the global south, what publications they're in, um, which publishers that those, those publications are in, and many other, including whether or not things have been retracted, the language, and sustainable development goals. So that was a really quick shotgun approach to give you a sense of how we're using Roar, but please do play around with Open Alex. Feel free to ask me in the chat specific questions to that, and, um, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for that, Kyle. Um, I always appreciate someone who's willing to give a live demonstration. <laughs> um, our next presenter is Andre Andrea Bellini. Andrea? Yeah, thanks. I'm going to share the screen. I have um, an art task now after this cool presentation from Alex, from Open Alex. <laughs> Okay, let's try to, um, I will introduce you briefly about uh, um, For Science, the company where I work, and we will talk about the space uh, Chris Roar integration, uh, what is coming next, and uh, uh, the plan for the space 8 uh, and uh, Roar. So very briefly about For Science, uh, we are an international company that are based uh, in Italy and the US. Uh, we work with uh, open standard and cutting edge technology. We actively support open source uh, community. Our primary focus is the space platform. We are the major contributor of the space community. Uh, we love to share what we do with the community. So we feel that is uh, both important to share with uh, the, the technology than the community of practice. So we are actively involved and uh, the Confederation of Open Access Repository in, uh, with uh, OpenAir, with ORCID, that site, uh, and we collaborate with ROR as his integration will show. So why ROR is relevant for this space, for a repository platform? Uh, ROR allows to disambiguate uh, publisher, funder, sponsor, partner, contributor organization. And as we get from the previous presentation, getting uh, this ambiguated uh, organization allow us to make a benchmarking and to analyze better the content in the repository. Science Display 7, uh, now you can also track research profile inside your repository. So they are called person item in this space. 
And this person item, this research profile can be, of course, linked to organization units. So to the department, to the university, to the place where this researcher has worked, was graduated, and so on. And moreover, ROAR is more and more used in other systems to disambiguate the uh, organization unit. So it's um, play a very important role at interoperability level when we need to share information, accurate information about the organization unit. And uh, specifically also to push this information to ORCID. So the integration with uh, ROAR is available in the space Chris, that is the open source extension of the space maintained by For Science, Science October of last year. Uh, it's used to provide external suggestions, so type ahead uh, suggestion when you need to provide to input an organization unit uh, as a funder, as a publisher, or as affiliation for uh, your researcher. It's also allow you to import um, organization data from the raw registry locally to create the local record of this organization. And again, uh, to, it's more powerful where you don't see uh, raw, the raw ID. The place where raw ID is more powerful is in the interoperability layer. So when we send data to ORCID, when we exchange data, when we register a DOI and we mine the OI with data site and send the metadata of the publication, we include the raw ID in the affiliation uh, detail. And it's also shared with OpenAir when, uh, via the um, CRIS guideline. So some concrete example. In the, uh, in the repository, in the space Chris, you can look up for organization when you are providing specific metadata. So uh, for instance, here you can search for a sponsor, you can search for the University of Bern, and you will get a um, corresponding uh, record from the registry. Uh, additional detail from this organization are displayed and can be configured so that you can disambiguate um, and uh, pick the right selection. The lookup in the space crease is available uh, for any kind of, uh, um, of input um, widget of the organization unit. So also when you input the complex information like um, order for a publication where you need to specify both the order than the affiliation, you can use the raw lookup to search for the organization unit for the specific affiliation. In this case, you see example of University of California or the Dominican University of California. Once that you select the right people, uh, the space Chris will keep track of the selected affiliation and this specific icon that can be customized uh, mean that the organization unit is found on the registry but is not an internal organization. And uh, with a mouse over, you can uh, look to the detail from the uh, uh, registry. But again, uh, the lookup also appears when you are looking for funder. If you are describing uh, um, a funding or a project, you can look for funder and example here show um, the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Uh, by default, in this space case, you get your own integration for affiliation, for sponsor, publisher, and funder. So it's not only about publication, but also about funding and about person that can be linked to your unit. Uh, as said uh, before, you can uh, use the raw lookup in uh, um, any kind of widget in uh, this space case. So when you collect information about uh, um, affiliation employment of, of a person, you can search, for instance, for my previous uh, employee here uh, at the Italian Consortium, my name is Sineca. And you can also use ROAR as an, ex as an external source to import item into the repository. So you can just search for an organization unit name, uh, get a list of results, uh, get to the detail to see uh, the additional information available in uh, the registry and use this information to profile the um, local record in, repo in the repository to, to import this data. And this is really important because in the repository, you can also 
manage maybe internal organization that are not so high level to be relevant for ROAR. So you can manage, for instance, your working group, your department, and link this department to the high level organization, uh, your high level organization into registry. So what is uh, coming next in this space, Chris? We plan to enable it uh, by default also for education and qualification. You can do that, but right now require additional configuration. Uh, we want to show also the current information from ROAR during the type I had uh, suggestion. Um, we want to give more information about uh, the ROAR record when we are searching the registry before importing. And we want to expose the ROAR ID uh, according to the display guideline. Um, and again, uh, right now, when we import the information from ORCID, we just keep the name of the, of the current organization, but we want to keep also the ROAR ID during the import so to don't lose the detail about this, this relation. And at the interoperability level, uh, we will, we plan to benefit more and more from the ROAR ID uh, switching to the uh, new version of the recent protocol. So data site schema version 4.5 that has been realized a couple of days ago also introduced support for ROAR uh, at the publisher level uh, and uh, um, open air guideline for literature repository version 4.1 uh, will do will do the same and will also allow to use ROAR uh, to the ambiguate uh, um, funders. Uh, very last thing, uh, what about the play in this space? So what I show you is the space Chris, open source free extension of, uh, of the space, but what about the mainstream? So the normal the space. Uh, for science have, um, thanks to funding received from the California Digital Library, has implemented integration, has adapted integration also to the space, to the play in this space. And we have created a pull request for the space O8. Right now, they are under the review uh, process of the community and are expected to be included in the coming this space uh, uh, 8.0 version. So in May of this year, you have the link to the pull request here. So you are invited to review, uh, try it yourself, and this will uh, make uh, easier to, to get this contribution in, uh, in this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, I have some questions about um, for others, for all everybody about displaying the raw ID. I found that so fascinating what you said about sometimes it's more powerful when you don't see the raw IDs. So um, food for thought. All right, our next presenter is Paloma from Orchid. Paloma, feel free to share your screen. Everyone. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Just a minute. There we are. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting Orchid and inviting me to uh, this uh, fifth Aurora anniversary. Congratulations, everyone. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about is why Orchid and ROAR. So basically how Orchid is using ROAR to disambiguate organizations' names. First of all, uh, it is important to know that the IDs for affiliations that we have been using at Orchid have uh, switched uh, over time. So here I've highlighted a bit in this graph uh, when we introduce completely uh, ROAR into the registry and how actually ROAR is growing now, being the default identifier that we use for affiliations. Understanding that when we're referring to affiliations, we refer to employment, education, and also professional activities. So at the moment, we have about uh, 1 million to um, 100,000 records that contain affiliations or professional activities with a ROAR ID, and over uh, 50,000 different ROAR IDs are used within the registry. And something that we've noticed since we introduced ROAR is also that the percentage of affiliations without identifiers has dropped, which means that it is way easier to identify the affiliation of a researcher, because when it is only based on the name, that might be a bit complicated sometimes. In general lines, and as probably you know, there are three ways for affiliation data, affiliation and professional activities data to get into ORCID. 
At the moment, the uh, most used one is that the researchers themselves at the affiliation or professional activity using the um, interface. Uh, this is about 31% uh, of the records that contain affiliation data. Um, and then also member organizations have two possibilities, either using the member API with their own integration, for example, a free system, as um, Andrea was mentioning before, or the affiliation manager, which is this tool for consortium members, where they can use a CSV file and upload that containing the information about the affiliation or professional activity and the raw ID. And then this information goes into the registry and is displayed. The main difference is that when a member organization adds those affiliations, then uh, we call them validated affiliations and we pro or they provide basically with this addition what we call trust marker. So this is what you're probably going to see with a green tick. Um, and here you can see two examples of that. Los Alamos National Laboratory and Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv, both uh, using ROAR in order to add those affiliations. In the first case, it's a custom integration using the member API, and in the second um, is a uh, integration using the member portal or the affiliation manager. Researchers have also the possibility to um, add these affiliation ma manually, as mentioned, and ROAR is used as the default identifier. So when someone is adding an employment, education entry, or any professional activity, like um, in invited position or service or membership, they can select their institution from the drop-down list. There, the ROAR ID will be the one used to classify organizations, and then the entry will look like this uh, second picture that you see there where the organization identifier is raw and then there are a list of um, or there is a list of other identifiers that are also provided by raw like fundref grief isni or the uh, wikidata identifier and moving forward with raw so it's not that we are stopping here uh, ROAR uh, will be soon the only identifier, not only for affiliations and professional activities, but also for funding entries. So you know that in the ORCID reg registry, organizations and researchers can also add funding data. Uh, in this case, those funding bodies are identified with FundRef and considering that um, these are going to be mapped into ROAR soon, we are going to use that as well for funding. And a very important thing, particularly when uh, researchers are adding affiliation manually, is that we plan to start importing also the field other names. So at the moment, we work with the main field, so to say. Uh, Amanda, you can probably mention how exactly you say that in the, in the uh, raw metadata schema, but I will use the term main name. Uh, for example, here, uh, Universidade Estadual Paulista, UNESPI. However, if researchers are entering the short name only UNESPI, or if they are using the English name Sao Paulo State University, then they might not find the institution. So what we are going to do is to begin working with these other name sections so that um, people can find the institution as well if using another language that has been registered with RO. And with that, I thank you all very much uh, for listening to this uh, use case, and I hope it was helpful. That was wonderful. Thank you, Paloma. Um, ORCID is such an important partner for us. Um, all right, so next we will hear from Daria Piccinelli uh, from Springer Nature. Daria, if you're all set, you can share your screen. One second. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? You yes, should be good. Yep. Okay. Okay. So hi everyone. I'm Daria Piccinelli working uh, in metadata development at Springer Nature. And I would like to present a recent implementation that we did to integrate ROAR in our publication processes and metadata. 
So first, I would like to provide some brief con context on why we did this. Um, uh, first of all, we have seen how ROAR has emerged as a preferred open organization identifier within the scholarly infrastructure, so gaining support uh, over time. And this is understandable since uh, the registry and related services are completely free and open and align with the principles of um, open science, open data, for fair research data for which we uh, at Springer Nature stand for. And in the past few years, or has been included as a priority PID in various contexts, like in PID national roadmaps and strategies, long-term strategies, such as in the UK, for example. Um, alongside ORCID for people, DOIs for outputs. And also we have seen how digital science, the organization behind GRID, which provided the seed for ROAR to develop and also helped ROAR to develop for a while, has decided to terminate its public releases and so to leave space uh, for ROAR to develop and in a way elect ROAR as its open successor. And we also um, wanted to support ROAR to deliver its full potential because as you can nicely see in the image on the right from the More Brains Cooperative, I hope that I can use it. I like it a lot. That's why I <laughs> wanted to show it. Um, ROAR and in general persistent identifiers um, need to be properly integrated and exchanged by a series of system workflows um, in order to provide value, such as funder, institutional systems, and so on, but also publishers' processes. And so we, as a publisher, have a responsibility to, to ensure that use and seamless interoperability are achieved. So coming to the to the what. So uh, as said, the integration of ROAR in our processes had started from a focus on external needs, looking at what was going on in the world around us, what customers needed. And we also wanted to cover as much content and metadata as possible, uh, considering that we have a variety of content, books, journals, magazine, and also publishing workflows. Um, also at the same time, we wanted to get uh, data, correct data. So for all these reasons, we have implemented ROAR, so a ROAR API call during uh, production. And what we do, we take the already typeset affiliation metadata, which is in our uh, internal XML format, which is the practically the affiliation data originally provided uh, via article submission systems or via book submitted manuscript. And so we can have it also for authors and editors, depending on the publication. And we use that to call the raw API. Here we have an example, specifically um, an affiliation, the affiliation endpoint. And from that um, API response, as you can see, you can get different items. This is an example for the affiliation department of respiratory and sleep medicine, Liverpool Hospital, Liverpool, Sydney, Australia. And from that response, we take the item that is um, recognized by a token chosen true. And in the end, we simply include that back to our typeset affiliation metadata. And we also already translated, um, so we already translate raw IDs in our, uh, let's say in external data format, such as, such as chats XML. And we also, uh, as you can see, maintain grid and ISNI IDs for um, internal uh, and external needs. Um, coming to, uh, so this implementation that we introduced at the end of last year um, allowed us to collect already a lot of raw IDs. So we already have more than a million raw IDs in our data and we're unique. 24,727, which is cool. And we have reached an initial 70, 75% of raw coverage in our um, data. So there is room for improvement. And as a first step, we are expecting uh, the service to, to get better. So aiming to achieve a higher coverage. And we also plan to add raw IDs to already published publication. So for say for consistency, so where we have great IDs in our backlist content, we should be able to easily map those to raw IDs. And we also, um, to really champion standardization, 
um, we plan to provide affiliation metadata and raw IDs to Crossref during metadata deposit, DOI registration, as we already do for other PIDs such as ORCID IDs, funder IDs, and so on. And also lastly, uh, we will also evaluate other potential internal use cases for ROR. So this is it. We're happy to have taken this first step and we're looking forward to improvement and definitely to see more ROR developments in the future. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you. That's wonderful, Daria. Um, so happy to hear about that. And yes, for those of you who um, were not in the last session or who have not otherwise heard, um, Roar and Crossref are uh, working on an improved affiliation matching service. Uh, we know that that affiliation matching is a, is a key service for a, a lot of uh, potential and current Roar users. So yeah. All right, our next presenter is Savannah Sims um, from the US Department of Energy Office of Scientific and Technical Information. Savannah? Thanks, Amanda. Get my screen up. Does that look good? All good? Cool, thank you. Well, hi, my name is Savannah Sims and I work with the US Department of Energy's Office of Scientific and Technical Information, also known as OSTI. OSTI collects, preserves, and disseminates research outputs emanating from DOE-funded research and development activities at DOE national labs and facilities, as well as universities and other institutions nationwide. OSTI does this by providing access to DOE research outputs through a suite of web-based searchable discovery tools. And we also offer a number of persistent identifier-related services and support to the DOE community, which is how I come to my topic today, a project we've been working on related to RORE entries. So OSTI is trying to include persistent identifiers whenever possible within the research lifecycle, and we want to have PIDs associated within our outputs. We're preferencing ROAR IDs for organizations, and we want to make sure pertinent DOE organizations have ROAR IDs. We initially set out to find out how many DOE national labs and Office of Science user facilities did not have ROAR entries. And in doing so, we quickly recognized that there was a need for standardization across existing DOE entries and for a set of guidelines for moving forward. I worked directly with ROAR to determine some best practices and with the team at OSTI developed a set of standards for DOE ROAR metadata entries. Um, one of the primary issues that we came up against initially was the matter of hierarchical relationships. There are many offices and sub offices contained within DOE and these relationships can sometimes be complex, but preserving these hierarchies is important to us. Since it's best practice to only go one level above and below in the relationship fields, um, Roar suggested that we capture the hierarchy within the alias field, which is located in the other names area on the Roar entry, and this has worked well for us. In the screenshot on the right, you can see what that looks like. Um, we write out the entire hierarchy in the alias field. So for OSTI, it's U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Science, Office of Scientific and Technical Information. The first phase of this project was dedicated to DOE National Labs and Office of Science user facilities. I examined any existing entries for accuracy and consistency with our metadata standards, collected metadata for labs and user facilities without entries, and submitted the edits and new entries to work for publication. To the right, there's a table detailing the totals for the first leg of the project. Update requests were submitted to a total of 17 lab entries, 15 user facility entries, and three other organizations, which included OSTI, the overhead entry for DOE, and an initiative at Berkeley Lab. This totaled in 35 update requests. Metadata for a total of 14 new records were submitted, which were all Office of Science user facilities. The next leg of this ROAR initiative involved curating and creating ROAR entries for DOE funding offices in advance of the Open Funder Registry's plan deprecation. This was a little more extensive than the lab and user facilities because it required a lot of research. The Open Funder Registry is slow to update sometimes and had a number of offices that needed to be updated for us. This included some name changes, mergers, and reorganizations that had not been captured just yet. 
As with the lab and user facility entries, I reviewed all existing RUR entries for consistency with metadata standards, gathered the metadata for funding offices without RUR entries, and then submitted it to RUR for publication. There were a total of 11 records that had extensive update requests and 61 new records that were added. And right now I'm working to determine if any DOE funding offices were not represented in the funder registry, and if any are found and they don't have RUR entries, they will be added as well. I also wanted to mention how ROAR IDs are being used in OSTI's upcoming revamped organizational authority. OSTI curates organizational metadata submitted alongside DOE-funded research outputs. Um, this includes author affiliations, research organizations, and funding organizations. We maintain an internal organization authority that has decades of metadata to standardize organization naming within eLink, which is our research output submission tool, and within the records in our search tools. We've developed an updated organization authority with enhanced metadata, and we'll begin including RUR IDs within our metadata once we deploy this new authority as part of our new research submission tool, eLink 2.0. At the bottom of the slide, you can see a screenshot of what RUR IDs look like within an entry in our new org authority. And once we have that implemented, we will have RUR IDs associated with all the organizations within our metadata, which is our end goal. Thank you all so much for your time. If you find you have questions after the session or just want to talk, chat about DOE's VOR work, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Thank you so much, Savannah. Um, and I really, I, I appreciate your telling us about um, sort of curation work as well as uh, the work you've done to uh, incorporate VOR into your systems, because of course, sometimes that's a, a really important part of, of what we do. All right, um, we have one last presentation with two co-chairs. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Olson and or Luca Balletti. Yeah, I think it's Amanda, I'm gonna kick us off. Uh, and Amanda gave us a great uh, intro to what uh, Gray is. So I'm gonna tell you just uh, a little bit and show you who was involved in this. So um, the NIH started this initiative a few years ago um, with the idea being that um, the repositories that are not institutional repositories and are not the very specific um, output or disciplinary repositories, um, the NIH would really prefer as they're going through this process of having uh, required uh, data output shared and to have uh, characteristics that those repositories uh, should share, um, that they would actually bring us all together and we would work on not making all of our platforms exactly the same because uh, we are very different in many regards, uh, but to have consistency on some of the really critical areas around data sharing um, uh, and data management. Um, so we have a number of task groups that are part of our work uh, with the NIH and across our collaboration with the other repositories. Um, and a lot of the task groups have half a dozen or more people, but uh, Luca and I are are so good with our PID advocacy. They only needed the two of us to work on this one. Um, so we'll, we'll meet Luca here in a minute, um, but I'm from uh, the Center for Open Science in the OSF, and Luca is from Mendeley Data, two of those uh, repositories in the Gray initiative. Um, and uh, we have a number of of our plans across uh, all of the repositories in which ROAR plays uh, a role um, to have more consistent metadata and to have digital objects connected. There's, you know, there's um, the how doesn't necessarily need to be exactly the same across those different repositories, but that we're all doing something in this area uh, is important. And we picked out ROAR in particular um, as one that uh, was in the, the timing was right to jump on and work on this uh, together. So we put a task group together with uh, Luca and I uh, to discuss what, among those seven repositories, um, who is doing what with those war uh, uh, affiliations so far, um, and then start to agree on some of the common approaches um, that are important amongst us uh, when ROAR is involved. Um, and so by just making a data-driven decision, seeing where everybody stands now and what their plans are in the next year or so, um, just making a decision on those shared areas uh, and then helping each other uh, work in that direction. Um, so there was a few pieces there that we we called out as, again, the timing was was right to start to um, 
uh, to value these particular areas of um, including the author affiliations, obviously, that we've, we've talked about many times today, but also those faceting uh, and filtering and searching by uh, the ROAR identifiers that we've also uh, seen some great examples of. And then also, you know, working out how we transition to using ROAR for uh, funder identifiers as well. Uh, so we did uh, in two stages with a um, first stage being seeing where everybody stands uh, right now um, with our ROAR work. So just to give you an idea um, of those seven repositories, five of them are already using uh, ROAR uh, for the, their primary um, identifier for organizations. Many of them do have alternate uh, identifiers available as well. Um, three of them are using them for the funder identifying already, um, while others might still be using the, the Crossref funder registry at the moment. Um, five are sending those ROAR affiliations to, to at least to data site, um, if not also to Crossref. Um, four are sending the ROAR, those funder associations. Um, and two repositories um, are making those data sets browsable using the ROAR IDs uh, and one so far has mapped ROAR affiliations to legacy data. So affiliation strings like we um, saw some good examples earlier. Um, and now I'm going to turn it to, to Luca to talk you, to you a little bit about our second phase um, of this project. Still Sorry, with us? Had to, had to unmute myself. Um, uh, so, brief introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Luca Belletti. I'm a product manager at Elsevier, and I look after Mendeley Data, which is a free generalist repository, which is part of Grape, but I also manage the corresponding commercial offer, which is called Digital Commons Data. Um, what we're looking at here is all the tasks and deliverables uh, for the year two of the Gray uh, project. So there are three years and potentially can be expanded afterwards. And um, um, the, the, the main objective was to see where each repository was at and also to uh, plan um, what the repositories can do in common in the future and align themselves. One of the objectives of Gray is that um, there should be a an offer, a varied offer, um, but plentiful, plentiful offer of free repositories, free generalist repositories for researchers to choose from and upload their research data for free. And these repositories should be consistent with each other and at a high level of quality. I'm a bit conscious of time, so um, I'll probably skip over the deliverables uh, as we've seen them here, but we'll see, we, you don't have them in the slides that we'll, uh, that we'll share. Um, where we are at the moment is um, at a stage where we want to know the future plans of each of the seven uh, repositories in grey with regards to the implementation of raw identifiers, and for that, we have circulated uh, very recently a survey to the repository asking them uh, these questions about their future plans. Once we've got all the results, uh, we'll get together and see where we can align all the repositories, what recommendations we, we can circulate to the repositories. Um, I won't read them all out here because of time, uh, but if you spot something you've got questions on, just put them in the chat or I'll, we'll leave some time at the end for, uh, for questions. Um, uh, Eric, if you could move to the uh, this final slide, thank you very much. Um, so um, the way the task group was set up, each task group is time boxed. Uh, this was set up end of September, and we are approaching the final stage at the moment. Um, and the the format is discussions. They can be monthly. In our case, it was a bit longer than a month with representatives from all the great repositories, so not just Eric and myself, but from each of the other repositories, plus somebody from RAW and some from data site. And in this uh, particular instance, I want to thank Amanda very much because she was really instrumental in kicking everything off at our in-person meeting uh, in Oakland end of September and provided a lot of information, guidelines, documentation for us to really uh, get up to speed and um, uh, hit the ground running, as you as you say. Um, and uh, also somebody from data side, in this case, it was Kelly, uh, Kelly Status, and they joined us 
uh, in these calls and as well in, um, I'm skipping to uh, something in, in the second bullet point, um, a very active uh, raw channel in, uh, in the gray workspace on Slack where repositories that I had already implemented raw could share um, their advice and best practice those that were still finding their way around how to implement raw could ask the other repositories or data sites or raw themselves um, via Amanda. Um, and this really facilitated sharing knowledge, uh, getting up to speed very quickly with uh, what needed to be done. Um, the, uh, all the progress was shared in the monthly um, calls of the competition working group. Um, Co-petition working group being the ensemble of the seven repositories. Uh, Co-petition is a word uh, that has been coined, I think, where we are all competitors, but we collaborate together in order to uh, improve all of our offer and get it consistent uh, for researchers to use. Um, and then final final point is the deliverable, deliverables of the Toro task group, very similar to the deliverables of other task groups within Gray, its recommendations and best practices, which then all the repositories would evaluate and see if they can plan them into their, into their roadmaps for implementation. And all of this is coordinated and everybody's kept informed. So um, right now, for example, there's a survey for the year two um, and planning of year three, where each repository says, we've implemented this, we're planning to do that, this not yet, this we would need some uh, some assistance with. Um, okay, I believe that is uh, all that Eric and I wanted to share. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we'll be there for uh, uh, questions. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. And we are a little over time, but uh, I'll take it. Five minutes, not too bad, five, six minutes. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, um, but uh, if you do have additional questions, um, feel free to unmute and ask it. Um, I have several questions myself, but I will cede the floor. Um, we have some discussion about PubMed in the chat. Um, and as I say, um, there, um, I think, uh, I think PubMed is in, is in a bit of a unique situation as regards indexes and so on. I think a lot of people would love for them to use Roar, but we have not so far heard that they plan to. Um, that's something we can certainly follow up on and, and do more investigation into. I had a bit of a question for um, the various presenters, um, which is a little bit about um, how you uh, deal with this issue of displaying or not displaying raw IDs. I was really taken by Andrea's um, point that uh, in some ways the raw ID might be best, best not displayed, uh, that it is sort of most useful in the interoperability layer rather than as something displayed to the user. And I must say, I'll, I'll say it right up front, I'm, I'm a bit torn on this issue. We do have display guidelines for WAR in which we say, if you are planning to display the WAR ID to users, here is how you should do it, but you should think about whether or not to do it. Um, but then of course, I do always like seeing the WAR IDs myself because I'm a fan of WAR, <laughs> uh, but I worry sometimes that, you know, those who are not quite so in the weeds about, uh, metadata and persistent identifiers might not need to see the raw IDs uh, precisely because they're quite different from ORCID IDs. You know, displaying the ORCID ID makes a lot of sense to me, given that researchers need to maintain those profiles. Anyway, would anyone like to weigh in on that? Um, thoughts about displaying, not displaying raw IDs? Kyle. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. I, I feel the mixed feelings on this, but right now, I think it's such an important way of socializing what ROAR is. I think with a lot of databases like Open Alex, people are used to something happening on the background and not having the ability to edit necessarily and see their information. And for us, it's we want to drive them to Roar to let them see what it is, to know how they can interact and look at other institutions. And the best way right now is by showing them that ID. So that's what I'd say for, from our perspective. Great. 
Uh, Colin, you've got your hand raised. Feel free to unmute. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the this great discussion. I had a question mostly for Daria, but maybe others that are doing this as well. Uh, and that was around the collection of, of raw IDs uh, for article submissions. I saw you're doing it from the uh, articles at the sort of publication phase and um, applying raw IDs and things. Why not record them right from the point that the, the author is submitting the article where they're presumably giving you the affiliation details and so on? So any thoughts on that would be useful? Yes, I was about to answer your question. I was here, right? <laughs> oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, so that has to do a little bit with our processes of processing data from submission into production. So we might, and we also have different uh, submission platform for articles. So it, there are differences in how that is managed. So that is one of the reasons if we're looking at the article side, but we are also looking into long-term um, adding like a type ahead selection, which currently we have done on grid. Um, so potentially to look into ways to have that substituted with ROAR. So we have a type ahead implementation, but the collection of IDs really uh, happens at the point of um, production into our metadata. Hope that answers Thank you. your question. Yes, Andrea. Yeah, thanks. Well, I agree with all the previous speaker about uh, the momentum that uh, deserve to display through ID because we want to advertise about this important initiative. But also for the future, I think that uh, there is a chance that the raw ID could become uh, useful for this ambiguation like the ORCID ID. So in, uh, if the raw um, initiative will be very successful, what I hope is that the institution will start to really use raw ID also internally to, to manage mm -hmm. uh, the organization the, uh, detail, the organization structure. And in this case, the raw ID could be really the, the last thing to look to be the, very sure that you make the right selection. So in some case, the raw ID should still be displayed. It's similar to what is happening on the ORCID side. Uh, ORCID are asking now researchers to upload, institution to upload affiliation of researcher because they want to have good data about research. But organizations are all, also the only one that can provide good data about the organization structure because we know that the organization internally change a lot. Mm -hmm. So this could be very important integration between Ron and Chris system. Probably mm -hmm. the Chris system are the only one in, in the position to provide uh, good data uh, to Roar for not high level organization. Uh, Luca, I think you had your hand up next. Yes, and then just very quickly wanted to confirm what Andrea just said. We don't display the ID on Mendeley data, but I think it's needed for this ambiguation. And I wanted to thank all of the uh, presenters today that showed examples and let you know, um, it was a way for me to see how that could be implemented and how useful it could be. Uh, one example I had recently was the number of um, institutions in Latin America named Simon Bolivar. Uh, <laughs> so that so that would be that would be great. Thank you all. Yes, Paloma. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I think what uh, Andrea was saying about the the internal knowledge about roar in an institution is actually quite quite relevant. And there are many institutions that have their own affiliation guidelines internally how researchers should um, write their affiliation when publishing or when depositing data in a repository, etc. And uh, some of them are beginning to include also the raw ID. And this is also a way to identify, okay, this is the raw ID of my institution. So if I'm adding my institution, then I can identify that. And, and also it is true uh, that uh, the, the name might, might change or people sometimes end up using different languages if they are publishing in different languages mm -hmm. and so on. So having that uh, written, um, some people in the chat were saying also with the logo, uh, I think both the logo and the HTTPS might be super helpful in my opinion. Yes. 
And that is essentially what our guidelines say is that, you know, there's, we have a, a small version of our logo um, that you can display next to the Roar ID that can click through to it. So yeah, always interesting. Um, well, we are at the top of the hour. Um, I am very grateful to all of our panelists for uh, not just presenting today, but also for doing such a great job of, of integrating Roar and of helping us evangelize it to those who um, need to hear the good word about persistent identifiers for research organizations. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, we'll send you, of course, the uh, recording and slides afterward. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Take care. You. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone.